Let's, let's pray and we'll dive in. We're going to cover today, uh, Lord willing, the second, the second part of our instruction on the Abrahamic covenant and looking today at, at the, how the covenant has been realized. Uh, God has promised, made, made sure promises in the Abrahamic covenant, and those, covenant, those promises came to pass. So let's, let's pray and we'll consider those, those promises fulfilled. Our God and our King, uh, our Father, you are merciful beyond our, our understanding. We give you praise and thanksgiving uh, for your work, for the way you have made yourself known to us in the person and work of your Son and in the revelation by your Spirit of your Word written down for us that we might be able to study it and, and understand it and, and draw nearer to you as we, we behold uh, your, your, your essence, your triune glory as revealed to us in Scripture as we are able to meditate upon your promises made, those which have been fulfilled, and those for which we wait their consummation. We pray for your spirit to give us understanding as we work through our understanding of the Abrahamic covenant today. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, last, last week, as we're continuing through our study of the mystery of Christ, uh, the co- his covenant and kingdom by Dr. Sam Renahan, working through his outline uh, from the, the Abrahamic Covenant. I think it's an excellent outline. It, it helps bring out some of the, the, the most important points. And we, we could read full books on just the Abrahamic Covenant. But his outline is helpful to us. And last week, we looked at the initiation of the covenant. And walking through Genesis chapters 12 and 15 and 17. In chapter 12, we have the initiation of the covenant. It's, it's the promise of it, but it is not the covenant per se. It's the promise of a covenant that is to come. And then in chapter 15, the confirmation of that covenant. The covenant is is actually struck. As Abraham cuts the animal pieces in half, he's waiting on the dark, and he he shoes away, chases away the birds of prey, and then in the darkness, the Lord himself, symbolically through the the flaming pot, passes through those cut animal pieces and makes a sure promise. Then in chapter 17, we see not a new covenant or a different aspect of it, but an expansion of that same covenant covenant. And, and we're given, Abraham is given the mandate, the positive law of circumcision. So now let's consider today the realization of the covenant. As we look at the Abrahamic covenant, we need to understand the, the historicity of it. The Abrahamic covenant has been fulfilled. God has, has in Christ and, and through the the people of, of the old covenant has fulfilled the Abrahamic covenant just as he said he would. And let's kind of think of about several passages in the Old Testament and the New where we see this uh, explained to us very clearly in Joshua chapter 21. In Joshua chapter 21, here it is Joshua is leading the people into the promised land. And in verse 43, we read this Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it. And they settled there, and the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. And you can see the, the, the superlative language. It's not most or some or many of the promises, it's all the promises, not one word of all the good promises that the Lord made failed to come to pass. All the enemies had been subdued. Everything with respect to the land, the land of Canaan, had been fulfilled just as God promised. Then in Nehemiah chapter 9, we see the same thing. Looking looking backward now, Nehemiah is meditating upon this. And in, in chapter 9, verse 7, he says, You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram, and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you, and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite, and you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. And you'll remember the context there in in Nehemiah is post-exile. The people had rebelled. They had been driven from the land. And now, by the decree of God, working through the pagan king Cyrus, they have been returning. And now Nehemiah 
is leading the task of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah declares that you have kept your promise for your faithful. And then the writer of Hebrews. Looking now backwards from an even further, more distant perspective, the writer of Hebrews in 11, Hebrews chapter 11, that great hall of fame chapter in Hebrews. Speaking about Abraham, the writer says in verse 9, by faith he, Abraham, went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him, as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Now let's think about some of the promises made to Abraham. It was land, right? But it was also descendants, more numerous than the sand of the seashore, more numerous than the stars of the sky. And the writer of Hebrews says that also was fulfilled. Now we can also look at the Gospels. In the Gospel of Luke, there is a song of praise sung by Mary, the Virgin Mary, as she is with child. And in the very end of her song, she says, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Now, what's she talking about? Is she talking about the promise of the land? No. Is she talking about the promise of, of multiple thousands upon hundreds of thousands of descendants? No. She's talking about a single descendant that was promised also to Abraham. So we see Jeremiah or Joshua testifies to the promise of the land being fulfilled. Nehemiah also, the writer of Hebrews, testifies to the fact that the, the generations of generations of generations promised to Abraham have been fulfilled. And here Mary testifies to the fact that an offspring that was promised to Abraham, the one who would take away the sins of the world, has come. Zechariah, later in that same chapter in the book of Luke, in chapter 1, the father of John the Baptist, Zechariah, also prophesies. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Both Mary and Zechariah testify of the, 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 the pinnacle of the Abrahamic promise that a Redeemer would come. That the singular offspring of Abraham, promised to Abraham, promised again to Isaac, promised again to Jacob, and that promised even again to, to, to David, that through his line a king would come. God's promises proved sure. God proved faithful to his covenant. And as revealed in the word of God, the covenant made with Abraham was, was fully realized. There's no part of it, not one word of all the promises that God made has failed in its fulfillment. The promised land, the promised numerous descendants, and the promised seed, singular. And you'll recall in the book of Galatians, Paul makes much out of the fact that ultimately it was seed, not seeds, that was promised to Abraham. It was a singular seed, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So that gives us the realization of the Abrahamic covenant. As we, as we think about Genesis 12, 15, and 17, the initiation of, 
the confirmation and the expansion of that covenant. And then we can see, both in the Old Testament and the New, how the, the, the unanimous testimony of the prophets and of the apostles was that the Abrahamic covenant was fulfilled without one thing, one word, of promise being left out. Now this is important because for our, our last point in the outline, the Abrahamic covenant becomes the foundation of the Old Covenant. We, we make distinctions between the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant and the Davidic covenant, but, but all those collectively we can, in a sense, refer to as the Old Covenant. And this becomes the foundation of that Old Covenant. Dr. Renahan says this, as the kingdom of creation began with the covenant of works and was developed and expanded in the Noahic covenant, so also the Abrahamic covenant is merely the first among other covenants that will be added to the one in governing the kingdom of Israel. So this is the foundation. This is, this is a building block on which the other covenants will, will stand. The Abrahamic covenant is foundational for the identity of the nation of Israel. And if we think about the testimony, again, both in the Old Testaments and in the New, Israel identified itself in one particular way. They identified themselves as sons of Abraham, or as children of Abraham. You ask, you ask any, is any Israelite at any point in their history and, and ask them about their identity, and something in their, their testimony would have included Abraham. They identified as sons, as children, as the family of Abraham. So, for example, in Exodus chapter 32, Moses is praying for the people of Israel. And he says, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. Even as Moses is praying to God, he is self-conscious about their identity as sons of Abraham. And, and by extension, as sons of Isaac and Jacob. The psalmist. This was a constant theme in the Psalms. So, for example, I'll just give you one. Psalm 105, verse 6. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham. His sworn promise to Isaac, when, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. See, the psalmist says, O offspring of Abraham. They, they were self-conscious in their identity as children of Abraham. So this in this way, the Abrahamic covenant is foundational for the entire Old Covenant system because it was their very identity. And we can trace this through the New Testament and see how the Jews consistently referred to themselves and they identified themselves as sons, as children of Abraham. So, for example, just prior to his martyrdom, we can look at the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen Stephen is, is one of the, the deacons there from Jerusalem, and, and he is the first recorded martyr in the New Testament. Just prior to his martyrdom, he, he stands and gives a speech, and he's summarizing all of the history of Israel in, in, a, in a, a relatively short speech. It's a long speech, but relatively short compared to all of the history of, of Israel. And he, he recounts how they had consistently rejected the prophets, and ultimately they rejected their own Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, but he speaks of their identity in Abraham. Listen to what Stephen says. This is in Acts chapter 7, verse 2. And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Even Stephen, even, even after the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, even after his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, Stephen still refers to, to he says, we, our father, Abraham. And then a little bit later in verse 8, in this same speech, he says, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac, 
and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And, and every Jew would have said, we would have known from which patriarch they descended. They would have all known themselves to be sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the patriarchs. Renahan again says, as a covenantal foundation, we find that in the scripture, subsequent covenants are made with the same parties, Abraham's offspring, in the same kingdom realm, Canaan, with the same promises, blessed life in Canaan, and with the same precepts, positive law, and the same penalties, disinheritance. Therefore, what is commonly known as the Old Covenant began with Abraham and ought to be viewed collectively in such a way that the Old Covenant includes the Abrahamic Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, and the Davidic Covenant. What the Abrahamic Covenant established, the Mosaic and Davidic Covenants connect to and expand. So while we see these as distinct covenants, we ought to refer to them collectively as the Old Covenant. And it is because the same parties are involved, the same promises are involved, the same penalties and sanctions are involved, the same positive laws are involved. Now let's, let's consider some specific ways that the, that the Abrahamic covenant is the foundation for the, the entire old covenant system. We've seen that this was their national identity. This was the, both their personal and national identity as Jews. But here, we also see specifically that the, the Abrahamic anticipates, the Abrahamic covenant anticipates the Mosaic covenant. The Mosaic covenant represents an expansion of the Abrahamic. And this is really important. The Mosaic covenant, while a distinct covenant, is actually, in its substance, an expansion of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, 400 years had passed between those two covenants, and that 400-year time period helps us to understand how it is that the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenants are connected and related. While, while living as a nomadic people, still primarily a family or a clan, there would have been no, no real use for the entire Mosaic law. We think about this. Abraham... His descendants, Isaac and then Jacob, Jacob and his sons go into Egypt. Remember, Joseph, the Lord in his providence sent Joseph there before them. By the time Jacob arrives, Joseph is second in command of all of Egypt. He is in, in charge of the storehouses. It was Joseph's brilliant plan revealed to him in a dream by the Lord that caused him to prepare in such a way that he, he built storehouses to, to, fill, to fill up in seven good years, knowing there would be seven lean years coming, seven years of drought and uh, want and lack. It is during that time that Jacob and his sons sojourn into Egypt. We won't recount the whole story of Joseph. You, you know the story. Joseph ends up providing for his brothers and his father and invites them to join him in Egypt. And that ends up being the beginning of a 400-year stay. And we're told that at, that, that at a later time, a Pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph, and he put the people under bondage. And it was 400 years later that the Lord would raise up Moses to deliver his people out of Egypt. Now, living, so they go into Egypt not as a nation, per se, but as a family, as a clan. So as a family and a clan, the, the, all the judicial laws, all the ceremonial laws of the Mosaic Covenant would have not been necessary. And also, living under subjugation, under bondage in the nation of Egypt, those laws and those statutes would have not have been profitable to them. But having come out of Egypt, they are now come out as a mighty nation. Millions strong. And it is there at Sinai that God gives them the Mosaic Covenant. We'll see this next week. We'll begin looking at the Mosaic next week. But we need to understand the Mosaic as an expansion of the Abrahamic. It is not an entirely new covenant in that sense. and It's an expansion of the Abrahamic. But in either case, whether as a family, a clan, or whether as a nation, 
or whether in bondage in Egypt or wandering in the wilderness, the threat of disinheritance remained. The sanctions remain. The same sanctions remain. So we can say conclusively that the Abrahamic covenant anticipates the Mosaic covenant. The mark of circumcision, that positive law, remained. All the time they were in Egypt, it remained. Which was why when you read about Moses, and that Moses had not been sacri- uh, uh, circumcised, nor his son. And why that was a grievous thing in the sight of God. The positive law remained. We also see, this is another reason that the Abrahamic covenant is a foundation for the entire Old Covenant. It's because the Abrahamic covenant also anticipates the Davidic covenant. Listen to to Dr. Sam Renahan again. The Abrahamic covenant includes a promise of royalty twice. Once to Abraham and once to Sarah. That promise is picked up and carried along at least twice again, once to Jacob and once to Judah. Abraham and his descendants, which will be a numerous nation in a large land, have been promised kings. This anticipates the Davidic covenant. More than once, to Abraham and to Sarah, God promised that kings will come from you, not just sons, which was remarkable enough to a man who was 99 years of age, but royalty. Kings will come. And then the Lord repeats that same promise, both to Isaac and to Jacob, that kings will come from your own body. Well, this is, finds its fulfillment in the Davidic covenant. So it, it, it anticipates the royal promises given in the Davidic covenant. And, and in a couple of weeks, we'll consider the Davidic covenant. What we'll see there is that God makes explicit and very specific There were general promises of kings made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then of those patriarchs, we're told through Jacob's line that it would be through Judah that the scepter would stand. And then we find with David, he's the anointed one that the Lord has chosen to serve as the archetype, as the the typical king that would anticipate Christ. Now, lastly, In terms of anticipation, the Abrahamic covenant anticipates also the new covenant. The Abrahamic covenant anticipates the new covenant. Now, we've talked much in our introduction to this study about typology and about how we have types and antitypes. And antitype does not mean against the type. It means uh, before. We have have the, the type, and you have that which is the fulfillment of that. So there are two ways that the Abrahamic covenant anticipates the new covenant. One, the prom- it promises the new covenant. That's explicit in the Abrahamic covenant. It promises the new covenant. And two, it typologically pictures or prefigures the new covenant. We need to think about both of those. One, in its, its explicit form, and two, in its typological form. And first, the, the, covenant pro, the covenant promises, the Abrahamic covenant promises one seed, one offspring, a singular offspring who will be a blessing to the nations. And the promised blessing of the promised Messiah are contained in the Old Covenant, but not yet revealed, not yet manifested or instituted. But the promise is there. Uh, Renahan again, from its inception... The Abrahamic covenant is not just anticipating the new covenant, but carrying it within itself. The old covenant is pregnant with the new covenant. It promises the new covenant because it promises the mediator of the new covenant to be born in their midst, or be born from their midst. The Abrahamic covenant provides Christ. Christ provides the new covenant. So that's that's the chain. The old covenant, or the Abrahamic covenant in particular, promises this seed, this offspring, who would be a blessing. So the Abrahamic covenant is the one that provides Christ. And it is Christ who provides the new covenant in his own blood. Every Lord's Day, as we observe the Lord's Supper, we are reminded what he said. He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This was, this was personally obtained and fulfilled by Christ. So that's the explicit form. 
That's the, that's the explicit way that we look at the Abrahamic covenant anticipating the new covenant is by the explicit promise of that promised seed, the promised Messiah, who would be the foundation, the cornerstone indeed, of the new covenant. But there's a second way that, that the Abrahamic anticipates the new, and this is what I said a minute ago, typologically. The Abrahamic covenant typifies or pictures something else. Now, I'm going to ask you to go back in your memory breaks a little bit. Several weeks ago, in our, our earlier lectures on this, we talked about typology and how in biblical typology, the anti-type is always two things. It is always other than the type and greater than its type. Other than and greater than. But we see precisely that with respect to the Abrahamic covenant being the type and the new covenant being the anti-type. Remember, other than and greater than. The people, the land, and the kingship of the Abrahamic covenant are typical. We have kingdom, or we have people, land, and kingship within the Abrahamic covenant. Those are typical. It means, means they're pictures. They're signposts that find their fulfillment in greater and other. Greater and other people. Greater and other land. And greater and other kingship. Dr. Renahan again, the Abrahamic covenant looks forward to one through whom all nations can be united and blessed. Not just one people in one place. The typology of the Abrahamic covenant and its special relation to Christ, according to the flesh, make it a covenant of guardianship. Well, that's precisely the language that the Apostle Paul uses in the book of Galatians, isn't it? The law was a guardian. Sam goes on, the purpose of the Abrahamic covenant is to bring the new covenant into existence by bringing its founder, head, and mediator into existence. And Abraham's belief in the greater reality that those earthly promises pointed to is set forth by Scripture as the paradigmatic model, meaning it's a paradigm, for belief in all of history. Abraham is the man of faith, and all those who believe as he believed are his children, not according to the flesh and not according to his covenant, but according to the Spirit, according to the pattern of his faith, and according to the new covenant of the offspring of Abraham, Jesus Christ. So we can see that the typology, as, as to use Sam's language, pregnant here in the Old Covenant, is revealed to us in the New in a pattern of other than and greater than. The people are other than the genetic descendants of Abraham, but they're also greater than. We are heirs by faith in greater promises. The Lord Jesus Christ said this is a better covenant because it's made on better promises. You can read that in the book of Hebrews as well. We also have a better promise. It's the, 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 the land of Canaan was literal historic land that they literally and historically possessed. And yet it signified, it typified, it pointed to a greater inheritance. Abraham himself, we saw in Hebrews 11, looked to a city whose, whose foundations and builder was God himself. We look to the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the new heavens and new earth that is promised to us, which is greater than and other than the literal land that Israel possessed. This is one of the deficiencies in, in the, the thinking and theology of some of our dispensational brothers. They are thinking that, the, that we're going to see a restoration of the promise of the land, and they don't fully understand the significance of the typology. I'm not interested in a piece of dirt in Canaan. I'm just not interested in that. And nor should any of us be. We are looking to something that is other than and greater than that land. But it points us to something very, very important, our heavenly kingdom. Then, of course, we have a, a federal head, a mediator, that is other than and greater than the king typified in Abraham. We have the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who is not just the father of many nations, as Abraham was, but the Lord and giver of life, the savior of men's souls, the one who provides a joint inheritance to all of his brothers and sisters, a heavenly inheritance. Let's consider one last 
point. We'll close with this. Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant also echoes Eden. So when we think about the Abrahamic covenant, we want, to, we want at, the, at the same time to look forwards and backwards. We look forward by saying it anticipates the Mosaic covenant, it anticipates the Davidic covenant, and it anticipates the new covenant. And at the same time, we ought to look over our shoulder a little bit and see that it echoes Eden. The Abrahamic covenant looks ahead with its typology, but it also glances back at an echo of Eden. And these echoes are seen in God through Abraham, establishing a new sacred land, a new place of sacrifice, a new federal head with a commission that would bring blessing to the whole world. See, those are things to which Adam was charged by God. Here is the sacred place. Here is your sacred duty to work and to keep. And we've talked about that. Those, those were, those were, were worship-related terms, temple-related terms, to guard and to keep. Adam was a federal head with a commission to be a blessing to all the nations, to, to, to populate the earth and subdue it as the entire earth as a place of worship. Adam failed in that. Abraham here is given a very similar commission, uh, one that, that echoes that which was given to Adam. And Abraham's descendants would have to remain faithful to God's positive laws in order to remain in that land of special blessing, just as the descendants of Adam, just as Adam was given that same command as federal head of his descendants. Close with this final quote from Dr. Sam. He says, Throughout the Old Testament, Israel is treated as a new son of God with a new temple in a new paradise. But like Adam, they were an unfaithful son and they were cursed, disinherited, and expelled. So as we considered last week, there is, there is a dichotomous nature to the Abrahamic covenant. There is a conditional and an unconditional. The conditional part, they failed at every, at every point. And they were ultimately cursed, disinherited, and expelled from the land. But God was faithful in giving them, that, giving them that land, giving them the descendants, all according to his unconditional promises, and most importantly, the unconditional promise of the singular seed of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who would be the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant in its full and final form, and would be the cornerstone of the new covenant, the covenant ratified in his own blood. So we'll close with that. Uh, any questions about the Abrahamic covenant? No? We'll close there. We'll take a break. Kyle, will you pray for us?